Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Department of Medicine's Grand Rounds. Thank you, as always, to everyone who's joining us today. In particular, thank you to those who are here in person. And we were just talking earlier that it, it is greatly appreciated and truly does make a difference to have a physical, tangible presence here, both to show support for our speakers who really spend so much of their time freely you know, creating these talks and taking the time to share their expertise and to help foster that sense of community and engagement that is so integral to Wash U. So thank you very much for being here. We have an excellent talk today and an even better speaker in Dr. Kristen Sanfilippo, who's a, a, an assistant professor in the Division of Hematology and truly a veritable expert in all things thrombosis. Um, she is a master clinician, a, um, a researcher, has served and does serve on a myriad of local, national, even international uh, panels and guidelines, most recently on the, uh, the COVID coagulation guidelines. So she's the perfect person to talk to us today. Um, about thrombosis, but perhaps even more than that, uh, what I find of Dr. Sanfilippo having met her just a little bit is that she seems to have kind of an inexhaustible capacity to, to share her expertise um, and knowledge with such kindness, both in these formal settings and informally when she gets, I'm sure, a myriad of emails from maybe pesky residents, myself asking all these questions. So always very grateful. So with that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. With that, Associate Professor Sam Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much for the invitation. I um, am much more in my comfort zone uh, presenting at Grand Rounds this time um, on cancer associated thrombosis, which is dear to me and, and an area that I spend um, the majority of my research time focused on. Um, even though I've had contributions to COVID coagulation, et cetera. And it's always, I hope, a, a, good, um, a good sign when the coagulation cascade is drawn on the chalkboard before you talk about clotting. So I'm, I'm hoping that's my, my good luck for this morning. So the topic of the talk today will be cancer-associated thrombosis. And, and I really will probably spend the most of the time on um, treatment and some of the complications of treatment. But I do want to bring up prevention at the end. I would really like to get to it. Um, because I think there's a, a, a really large deficit in awareness about um, the potential to, to prevent the disease and really not have to pay attention to the first 45 minutes of my talk because you've avoided um, the VTE in the first place. So here's my disclosures. Okay, so to talk about cancer-associated thrombosis, I'll talk a little bit about um, the epidemiology. So this was a, a Danish registry cohort study that was published in 2021, and they compared 500,000 patients with cancer and venous thromboembolism versus 1.5 million matched controls. Um, and what they found um, were a couple of interesting things. So first, when you look at 2017, um, the cumulative incidence, the 12 month cumulative incidence following cancer diagnosis of VTE was eight and a half fold higher um, compare in the patients with cancer compared to those in the general population. If you look at the six month cumulative incidence, it's even slightly higher. So the highest risk for cancer associated thrombosis tends to be um, in, the, in the short months that follow after diagnosis. That's usually when patients are getting interve interventions such as surgery procedures. They tend to have the highest disease volume. They're um, starting on um, their first round of chemotherapeutic agents. And you can see that um, with these six month cumulative incidents, that that 11 fold um, increased risk is, is really if we start to look at the individual cancers, I just pulled out some of them, um, that it's, it's really um, a heterogeneous risk, um, right? So Hodgkin's lymphoma, multiple myeloma, pancreatic cancer have 50 plus fold increased risk compared to the general population, whereas some of our more common cancers such as prostate and breast have still an elevated risk, still an important risk, but overall lower that's bringing that number down. I think the other important thing from this study was that if you look at over at the 20 year period that they studied, we can see that while the incidence of um, venous thromboembolism um, stayed relatively stable in the general population, it, it you know, arguably steeply rose in the cancer population um, about a threefold increase. 
it's important to understand the, the risk and treatment of cancer-associated thrombosis. So both venous and arterial thromboembolism are the second leading cause of death in patients with cancer. Um, so understanding how to importantly prevent but also treat um, is an important outcome for our patients. So we'll kind of go through treatment and, and much of, um, you know, so why do we talk about cancer associated thrombosis as its own dedicated topic instead of just um, lumping it into to venous thromboembolism? Well, that really started um, about 20 years ago with this study that was published by Prandoni and colleagues in blood. And what they showed was they looked at outcomes of patients with cancer and venous thromboembolism, so DVT or PE, um, versus patients in the general population with venous thromboembolism. They found two interesting outcomes. So the first was that patients with cancer had a threefold increase in the risk of recurrent venous thromboembolism in the 12 months following diagnosis, despite therapy, um, compared to patients without cancer. And that, that reached slightly over 20% um, recurrence. They also found that um, when treating cancer-associated thrombosis, these patients had a twofold increase in the risk of major bleeding. And you can see from the time period that was included in this study that these patients were almost exclusively on vitamin K antagonist, which kind of brought forth the first clinical question, what can we do to improve outcomes in patients with cancer-associated thrombosis? Well, at that time, we really only had two, two um, options for outpatient management. We had our vitamin K antagonist, um, so warfarin predominantly, and we had low molecular weight heparin, which could be um, prescribed and administered in the outpatient setting. And that led to the first error in clinical trials for cancer-associated thrombosis. I'll just go through two of them. I won't go through um, individually, but the, probably the most cited one, the, the most well-known is the CLOT trial that was published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2003, led by Aggie Lee. And what this trial did was it compared um, treatment with um, vitamin K antagonists, so um, warfarin versus low molecular weight heparin with dolteparin over a six month period for newly diagnosed cancer associated thrombosis. And the, the study showed a significant reduction in the risk of recurrent venous thromboembolism, so 17% down to 8% um, with the use of low molecular weight heparin and there was no increase in the risk of harm in this patient. So we didn't really improve um, the major bleeding outcomes, but we also did not increase them by improving our treatment. And then this is looking at all bleeding, um, clinically relevant and major. So Agnes Lee and colleagues actually did a second study that was published in JAMA in 2015 that then um, compared warfarin with tins of parents as still vitamin K antagonist versus low molecular weight heparin. And while there's a nice separation um, in the curves regarding risk of recurrent, this one actually wasn't statistically significant. Um, again, there was no um, change in, the, in, in major bleeding between the two arms. And why do I bring that up? So I bring that up just to, to kind of remind the audience of the importance of understanding the patients who are participating in your trials and interpreting the outcomes accordingly. So if you look at the patients who were in the CATCH trial, which found no significant difference compared to those in the CLOT trial, you can see that there are certain that, that certainly the patients in the CLOT trial appear to be somewhat sicker. So more of them had metastatic disease. Um, more of them had a lower performance status. More of them were on anti-cancer therapy, which is usually the patient population we're thinking of when we talk about cancer-associated thrombosis. And more of them probably had a, a risk for recurrent venous thromboembolism given their history. So there were several systematic reviews and meta-analyses that, that looked at combining these randomized studies um, for outcomes. And so I, um, this was one that was published in 2015 and included the major trials um, that compared low molecular weight heparin with, um, with warfarin, essentially. And what they found overall is that low molecular weight heparin decreases the risk of recurrent venous thromboembolism by 40% in patients with cancer over a six-month treatment period without increasing the risk of major bleeding. So we've improved outcomes, and how does that translate um, to, to the real world? So these were two publications um, that were observational cohort studies in the UK. Um, one was 35,000 patients without cancer, um, which is this um, study right here, and the other was 6,500 patients with cancer, 
and they looked at the incidence rate of recurrent venous thromboembolism. And you can see that um, when this treatment period is when these major trials were being published, when, when really the precedence for treating cancer-associated thrombosis um, changed over to low molecular weight heparin, and regardless, patients with cancer still have a twofold increase in the risk of recurrence looking at uh, real world outcomes. So why is that? What were some of the barriers to improved outcomes to help better design the future trials? Well, one, you know, I think a big one was the morbidity of the daily injections. And I, and I even see that today outside of cancer associated thrombosis. If we think a patient needs to stay on low molecular weight heparin, there are many patients that will say, I'm not going to do it. Um, and, you know, the second thing is the cost, um, which was a limitation for a lot of patients. Actually, my first prior off call after graduating medical school was to try to argue with an insurance company that low molecular weight heparin was the standard of care for cancer when I was a resident. But because of this, because of patient resistance, because of cost, because of reduced access in, a, in an unlimited access system, these are actually some of our data from the Veterans Health Administration that looked at what were prescription patterns for cancer associated thrombosis in 2013. And you can see that, that most of these studies had been published um, minus the CATCH trial, but still almost 50% of patients were prescribed warfarin um, as opposed to what was considered the superior standard of care with low molecular weight heparin. The other thing that happened um, kind of, you know, started to happen towards the tail end of the um, of the real world studies that I showed you was that we had a new option for outpatient management of VTE with a direct role anticoagulants. So they were coming to approval. And so there was a lot of question of, can we use these in patients with cancer? So this is actually a meta-analysis of the randomized studies that led to the approval of the direct role anticoagulants for venous thromboembolism. And active cancer was not an exclusion for most of these trials. And so what investigators did was they pulled out the patients with active cancer and looked at outcomes. And, um, and this meta-analysis actually, um, this publication was nice because it also reanalyzed the low molecular weight heparin versus warfarin data. What they found in this publication was that while it appears there's a lower risk with the direct role anticoagulants, um, that it, it is not statistically a significant reduction compared to warfarin. And similarly, with major bleeding, while there might be a lower risk, it's not significant. And so the overall conclusion from this article is until we have more data, really low molecular weight heparin remains our standard of care. And that led to the next era of randomized controlled trials for um, treatment of cancer-associated thrombosis looking at the direct oral anticoagulants versus the standard of care low molecular weight heparin. I won't go through all of these trials. There have been six of them. The last one um, in this table, the CANVAS trial has yet to be published, but we participated in it here. Um, and um, so the um, first trial, HOC-USI cancer, um, compared adoxaban, which we don't see prescribed much out, uh, probably outside of this setting, um, versus um, deltaparin for treatment of cancer-associated thrombosis. Select-D was rivaroxaban. ADAM-VTE, a very small trial, was a pixaban. Caravaggio, which was our, our larger study, which was a pixaban, um, small study with rivaroxaban Casadiva. And then Canvas was nice because it was pragmatic. It said, you know what, you can prescribe whatever DOAC you want to, um, as, as long as it's a DOAC, if that's the arm they're randomized to. And so instead of presenting those individually, I'll show you the, um, the meta-analysis that was just published in 2022 that includes all six of those trials. And um, what was actually overall found was that the direct oral anticoagulants reduced the risk of recurrent venous thromboembolism over six months of treatment um, by a little over 30% compared to low molecular weight heparin that they do not increase the risk of major bleeding, um, but that they do significantly increase the risk of clinically relevant, um, but non-major bleeding by about 66%. So based on the data that I um, have, show, have shown you, the, our major guidelines really recommend with a high level of evidence. So all of these randomized studies looked at six months of treatment, um, anticoagulation for the treatment of cancer associated thrombosis for six months. Um, but we have to think about what, what is the risk of treatment um, and what is the risk of treatment long-term, which we'll look at. So we'll focus a little bit on um, anticoagulant-related bleeding and cancer-associated thrombosis. 
So just to give you a general sense of, of kind of why this is its own topic, again, so I showed you the Prandoni trial in the beginning, which showed that cancer patients had a twofold increase in the risk of major bleeding. This is showing um, um, major bleeding outcomes in the cancer-associated BTE trials for DOACs, which um, over six months was 4%. If we look at the general population, which mostly um, were, were patients without cancer, their major bleeding over the same time period was 1%. So we do see a big difference in the risk of major bleeding between patients with cancer and without. And is that a significant problem? Um, well, this was a study that um, was published in 2020 and looked at 15 prospective cohort studies, observational cohort studies, and 14 randomized controlled trials to try to assess what is the burden of anticoagulant related major bleeding in cancer. And what they found was that the overall case fatality rate was about 9%. And then I think they're always important, especially you know, for the, the research that my group works on, is understanding that there is a significant difference between your healthy sick patient who participates in the randomized studies and your real world kind of observational data that's going to include a larger spectrum of patients and patients who harbor more uh, comorbidities. And so looking in those cohort patients, um, the case fatality rate for the major bleeding events increased to 14%. Even if death is not the outcome, um, anticoagulant related major bleeding is still, um, it is still a, a major problem in this population. So this is actually looking at our healthy cancer patients who participated in the HOC USI cancer randomized study at what happened when they had a major bleed. So two thirds um, of them slightly over were hospitalized. Most of them required stay in an intensive care unit. Most of them required transfusions. Um, and I think you know one in four um, required interruption in their cancer directed therapy, which for maybe some of our metastatic patients is not, um, is, is not a significant issue long-term. But some of our patients where the data shows that an early response predicts long-term outcome may may have long-term ramifications of interruptions in therapy. Um, and one in five patients required a procedure. So these, are, these were kind of guidance recommendations that um, I published along with um, a, an amazing um, group of researchers in 2022 that was kind of our, our, our data deplete um, area. It really comes after six months of treatment for cancer associated thrombosis. So these are recommendations on kind of trying to decide that. Um, and I will tell you that the majority of the guidelines really favor continuing long-term unless it was a clearly provoked event and the cancer has been cured. Um, the other time, so the American College of Chest Physicians recommends periodically assessing the patient's risk of anticoagulant related bleeding and making decisions about continuation at that time point. And so that's the, then that brings the next question. Well, who is at high risk of anticoagulant related bleeding and cancer? How do we make that assessment? Because there's really no guidance within the documents on, on what we should be looking at. And this is really uh, my area of research interest at this time. So I, we'll kind of walk through a little bit um, about what we know and um, where the deficits are. So this is, um, looking at, again, bleeding outcomes in the HOC USI study. So this was a doxaban as um, the factor 10A inhibitor versus low molecular weight heparin with doltaparin. And I think the important, one of the um, most important things we learned from this study was that 44% of all major bleeding events that occurred in the study occurred in the GI tract, which it may not be a surprise based on what we you know, know in, in terms of the DOACs already. Um, but if we look at the breakdown and look just at the DOAC major bleeding events, almost 70% of them were in the GI tract um, compared to only 30% in low molecular weight heparin. So that kind of teaches us our first point is that gastrointestinal bleeding is the most common source of anticoagulant related bleeding in cancer and that direct oral anticoagulants may increase that risk compared to low molecular weight heparin. And so that led to a kind of a stem of, um, of investigations as to why is that happening, especially with the direct oral anticoagulants. So one of the questions was, okay, well, is it just the patients with GI tumors? They have GI tumors in their GI tract, they're exposed to a blood thinner and they bleed. So this is the um, SELECT-D study, which um, looked at rivaroxaban, 
versus Delta Perrin. And um, I have the table here just for comprehensiveness, but I've really summarized it, you know, right here. And what you can see is if you focus on the major bleeding, that in the Delta Perrin arm, five out of the six major bleeding events, 83% were in patients with a GI primary tumor. Um, if we look in, or sorry, in the Delta Perrin, if we look in the River Oxaban arm, 73% of the major bleeding events um, in patients on River Oxaban had a GI primary tumor. So these do seem to be the patients that are having the bleeding complications. While the percentages aren't as high for clinically relevant non-major bleeding, they still represent a significant proportion. And there is some attention to bladder cancer as well, which I put it in there as, as having a higher risk. So based on this, um, when only the HOC-USI and SELECT-D studies had been published in 2018, there um, was the first meta-analysis that looked at all the studies. At that time, actually, major bleeding was significantly higher with DOAX compared to low molecular weight heparin, but they then separated out the GI cancer patients. Um, and what they found was that patients with a GI primary tumor, this was not based on resection or not resection, just <clears throat> they were identified as, as being somebody who had a GI primary, had a twofold increase in the risk of major bleeding with um, direct anticoagulation compared to low molecular weight heparin. If we looked at the remaining patients without a GI primary, while it definitely favors low molecular weight heparin, it's no longer a significant increase in the risk of bleeding. So then the next um, kind of question was, okay, well, which GI cancer patients are bleeding? And <clears throat> the Caravaggio study had nice data to look at this. So what they did was they looked at the, the outcomes of their major bleeding event by cancer type. And what I've highlighted for you here are the GI cancer patients, so colorectal and upper GI. And they separated them out between resected and, and non-resected. And what you can see is that all the major bleeding events that occurred, regardless of the arm, low molecular weight heparin or direct anticoagulation, are, were patients with unresected tumors, whereas patients who had resected tumors had no major bleeding events. <clears throat> so that kind of leads us to our next point that GI and GU tumors potentially um, have higher risk of anticoagulant-related bleeding. I think the data is pretty clear with GI tumors especially only if they're intact intraluminal tumors. <clears throat> I'll talk a little bit about intracranial hemorrhage um, and CNS tumors, because that's a question that I think we get frequently in, <clears throat> in regards to management of cancer-associated thrombosis. So if we look at some of the clinical trials, um, intracranial hemorrhage was actually 10% of the major bleeding events in the HOC-USI and the adoxaban group. Um, with 6.3% of major bleeding events with DOAX and almost 20% with low molecular weight heparin. If we look at Caravaggio, it's a low, lower overall percentage, but all of the major, all the intracranial hemorrhages occurred in patients on low molecular weight heparin. And so what else did we learn from these randomized studies regarding, um, you know, are these patients with brain tumors? Is that why, is that why they're having intracranial hemorrhage? Well, we didn't, unfortunately, <clears throat> learn much from the randomized studies because they either excluded the patients or enrolled very small numbers. This also doesn't tell us which anticoagulant therapy, of course, we should use in these patients given the low numbers. There has been a meta-analysis that's looked at, you know, the, the so-called safety of anticoagulant therapy in patients with brain tumors. So this top part looks at patients with brain metastases. The bottom part looks at patients with primary brain tumors, so think glioma. And what this shows is that anticoagulation, yes versus no, there's no significant difference in the risk of intracranial hemorrhage in patients with brain metastases, which is the good news if they have a venous thromboembolism is that their brain metastasis is not, is not an absolute contraindication to therapy. But you can see these patients have high rates of intracranial hemorrhage no matter what we do. If we do, if we look at the primary brain tumors, anticoagulation does significantly increase the risk of intracranial hemorrhage. And so this is really a point of discussion about what, what is the best and, and kind of so-called safest management of this population, which unfortunately is still a largely unanswered question. <clears throat> 
And so <clears throat> what the retrospective and uh, randomized studies have showed us is that anticoagulant therapy increases the risk of intracranial hemorrhage in primary brain tumors, but not in brain metastases, which have a high risk of intracranial hemorrhage no matter what we do. And maybe DOACs have a lower risk based on the randomized data, um, but again, very, less than 100 patients overall. And then I'll just talk briefly about thrombocytopenia. So this, this comes up as, especially on the inpatient service um, as, you know, what do we do with this thrombocytopenic patient and a new pulmonary embolism? So the incidence of thrombocytopenia in cancer can be as high as 30%. Um, so this was a study that looked at the three-month cumulative incidence in patients who were undergoing treatment. And overall, you can see it was 15%, but if you focus on the hematologic malignancies at the, at the bottom, that's where you're getting kind of your 30% um, average. And we don't, we don't have um, great data to support our management in this population because they're excluded from the randomized studies. So all patients with a platelet count of less than 50,000 were ex excluded from the randomized data. Um, Caravaggio excluded patients with a platelet count to 75,000 and select D up to 100,000. So what we do know is limited to prospective studies. I will briefly show the outcomes of Trove, um, which, um, you know, so you're looking at numbers of 100, 120 patients. Caveat had similar outcomes to Trove. Um, and then we have two currently enrolling trials. One um, is a randomized study. It's a pilot study. And I'll highlight it because um, this is the PI on this was our own Zufei Wong, who did her HEMOC fellowship here um, and is now in Canada. Um, but this is a randomized controlled trial that is looking at randomizing patients with thrombocytopenia and venous thromboembolism to either platelet transfusion to achieve a goal of 50,000 plus full dose anticoagulation or to do a modified dose um, anticoagulation based on the platelets. So what the, the results of the Trove study showed us, so this is a prospective observational cohort study. They did not give guidelines or recommendations on how to manage these patients. They really just focused on outcomes. So they enrolled a total of 121 patients. Um, most patients received full dose anticoagulation. About 25% received modified dose and a very small percentage, 10% um, or so received no therapy. Most patients had hematologic malignancy, which fits with where the thrombocytopenia is predominantly occurring. And many of these patients were inpatient at the time of observation, and so were on some derivative of heparin. But we can see that in, in regards to the outcome of major hemorrhage, that those on full-dose anticoagulant therapy had a two-fold increase in the risk of major hemorrhage in the setting of thrombocytopenia. And so the hope is, is, is actually um, that we will participate as an in, in, in institution in a randomized control study, better looking at this and gathering more data um, on how to manage these patients. So this taught us that thrombocytopenia is more common in hematologic malignancy and increases the risk of anticoagulant related bleeding. So I just put this up here, um, other kind of things that I consider in clinic when I'm looking at the risk and benefit of long-term anticoagulant therapy or even deciding which anticoagulant to use just in the interest of time. Um, so drug-drug interactions, which are important, and that includes both pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, um, renal function, fall risk, um, need for procedures, you know, increasing age, which is also a risk factor for um, anticoagulant-related bleeding, and of course, hepatic function. But I just go back to this slide and, and this high um, bleeding risk as being, a potential, um, as being a potential clinical reason to stop or terminate anticoagulant therapy after six months. And that comes back, well, we know some things about the patients who bleed, but does that mean that we can predict which patients are at the highest risk of bleeding? Um, so we can in other populations, right? So we have um, in the atrial fibrillation population, we have the has blood score, the hemorrhages score, which was, um, uh, which was developed by Brian Gage here. In, in venous thromboembolism in the general population, we have the VTE bleed score, which, um, which looks at predicting the risk of major bleeding between months two to six of anticoagulant therapy. And then even more recently, we've had um, a score that was derived for patients with cancer and venous thromboembolism to try to predict their bleeding risk. Um, so we kind of set out to see, well, would these scores work in cancer? Can we use those, um, especially at the six-month mark, to decide if somebody's at too high of a risk to continue on? 
So this is um, our, our Veterans Health Administration um, cohort that starts with over half a million patients. And our goal was really to look at patients with either newly diagnosed cancer and a, and a new VTE or metastatic or incurable cancer and a new VTE. And after several exclusion criteria, we have a final cohort of almost 12,000 patients. Um, and then within that, we have um, slightly over 4,000 patients that are actively on chemotherapy at the time. And so that drops because it's the Veterans Health Administration. And as you can see, most of our patients have lung cancer. We have a screening program. Some of those are going to be detected at early stages where they're cured with surgery or radiation and never go on to chemo. Um, GI cancers, again, colorectal screening program. Some of them will have early stage disease and prostate being our three most common. So we lose a lot of patients, thankfully, who don't need to go on to receive chemo. I think this is an, a nice um, kind of show of, of how I started this talk today in, in terms of how our evidence has changed over time. So this is um, prescription patterns within the VA. So down here, you can see warfarin decreases over time as we build data for other anticoagulants. Um, again, low molecular weight heparin kind of picked up steam at the end of that first error I showed you, stayed relatively stable until um, the DOAC trials were published in 2018. And now the DOACs represent the majority of our anticoagulant um, prescriptions for cancer-associated thrombosis. I won't go through this um, in detail, but this is a table that looks at the baseline characteristics of those who bled on anticoagulant therapy versus those that don't. And I think the, the hallmark is, is many of, many of the um, risk factors that are present in the risk models that I showed you in the beginning um, of this section were significantly higher in patients who had a bleeding event. So um, anemia, thrombocytopenia, uncontrolled hypertension, kidney disease. Um, but one thing that's the, a big part that's not included in these um, is the type of cancer, like I said. And you can see the bleeders had higher rates of um, genitourinary, upper and lower GI cancers, um, and metastatic disease. So our six-month cumulative incidence of bleeding in our full cohort was 7%, and um, at 12 months, it was 9.5%. Um, and I'll just, this is looking at the performance of available bleeding scores for anticoagulant related bleeding. Um, so many of these were developed for atrial fibrillation. Many were developed in an era of, of warfarin use. Um, and, and then uh, cat bleed was, um, was developed in patients with cancer associated thrombosis, mostly in randomized trials on adoxaban um, and VTE bleed, the general population. So if we look at each standard um, deviation increase in point, um, they do quite well over the first six months um, with a significant association with the risk of bleeding. Um, they lose some of that in months seven to 12 of anticoagulation because it's, it's a lower outcome number um, and most of the bleeders have declared themselves. But then we kind of pay attention to the C statistic column for both sides. So the C statistic, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with it, is a measure of discrimination. So it tells you if your model can discriminate between who's gonna develop your outcome of interest um, versus who's not going to. It typically ranges from a score of 0 0.5 to one, where 0 0.5 would be equivalent to chance and one would be you're predicting 100% of the time your outcome. Um, and we can see that the numbers here are, are really in the 0.5 range. So really on that bottom lower end, and, and we really need improved um, measures for patients with cancer to understand the risk of our long-term therapy. So I'll just um, include a, a brief how I treat um, and future steps, and then we'll talk about prevention. Um, so this is, is kind of a, a flow diagram that, that takes you through thinking about a patient with a newly diagnosed cancer-associated thrombosis and deciding low molecular weight heparin, which is um, you know still cited in the guidelines as being a reasonable choice and sometimes preferred over the direct role anticoagulants, which most of them otherwise favor overall. So when I have a new patient with cancer-associated thrombosis, the things that would really push me to the right to go to low molecular weight heparin um, would, um, you know, these, these were multiple experts kind of contributing, and I don't agree with all of them, um, but thrombocytopenia, we, it's, it's a really data 
deplete area, um, especially with the DOAX. And so I would tend to favor low molecular weight heparin. Of course, hepatic impairment sometimes stops you from being able to use the DOAX um, because of contraindications. I think, I think we know antiplatelet therapy from the cardiology data increases the risk of major bleeding in the setting of anticoagulation. And so really before even going through a decision tree, just having a conversation if the patient still needs it, many times they don't. Um, and then severe renal function, um, you know, whether or not you consider trying a pixaban, but again, those patients were excluded from the trials versus low molecular weight heparin. Type of cancer, um, you know, my, my comfort for the DOAX and GI and GU cancers is I typically recommend avoiding them if the primary is intact and favor low molecular weight heparin. Of course, drug-drug interactions, some of those stop us from, from being able to use the DOAX um, because of concerns about decreased or increased availability of the drug. Um, and then just what has that patient had in terms of GI surgery for their cancer? Are you taking away the DOAC absorptive surface? And if so, if they're missing significant por portions of their stomach or proximal small bowel, then low molecular weight heparin would be preferred. Um, here's just a little bit of, of how I um, approach a patient with cancer associated thrombosis and thrombocytopenia. So if the platelet counts greater than 50,000, you know, if it's 51,000, fine. They're doing full dose anticoagulation is what I typically recommend outside of um, additional major risk factors for bleeding. If it's less than 50,000, that kind of starts the decision tree about thinking um, and, and then you really have to start to think about the event they're presenting with. Is it a distal DVT? Well, management for that is much different than a pulmonary embolism. So in some uh, very high risk um, thrombotic events, we may um, transfuse the platelets um, to get them at least at 50,000 and give full dose therapy. But maybe some acute events that are lower risk or patients who have a chronic clot but still need to be anticoagulated. Um, many favor this 50% dose reduction for platelets between 25 and 50,000, um, which some observational studies support the safety of and um, holding anticoagulation for platelets of less than 25. Well, it's not clear if, um, if, if what I'm kind of showing now is, is going to change this talk in a couple of years because we don't know about the efficacy. I think there is a lot of hope within the cancer community that the factor 11, um, that, that through factor 11 inhibition, we can significantly reduce the risk of bleeding in this patient population. Um, so um, our, our institution is participating in a randomized clinical trial that compares a Pixaban um, versus one of the factor 11 inhibitors for treatment of cancer associated thrombosis. And there is an arm that allows randomization to low molecular weight heparin for patients with GI primaries, if that's the comfort. But what we've seen from the studies that have um, so far been published, this was a nice review of the clinical data um, in Jack that was published earlier this year, is that whether by looking for VTE prophylaxis, um, AFib, and the setting of stroke or MI, um, that really these seem to be decreasing the risk of bleeding or having no increase in the risk of bleeding versus placebo. So I think there's a lot of hope um, for factor 11 inhibition in cancer. So I'll just spend you know, eight minutes or so um, going over um, prevention of cancer associated thrombosis um, and kind of bringing awareness to that. So primary prophylaxis for prevention of uh, venous thromboembolism is well accepted in many areas. Um, so when you admit patients on the inpatient service, you know, we, you get a pop-up that tells you to prescribe some form of prophylaxis, typically heparin-based. Um, and that's, you know, um, based on um, kind of looking at these studies. So this was uh, systematic review and meta-analysis. And you can see that overall, the number needed to treat to prevent one event um, ranges from about 200 to 400 if you're looking for symptomatic DVT uh, all the way up to fatal PE. Um, and the number needed to harm is 714. So, you know, these numbers favor, favor treatment overall with um, easier to help than to harm. If we look in atrial fibrillation and the use of primary prophylaxis with anticoagulation to prevent ischemic stroke or um, systemic embolism, 
um, the number needed to treat there is only 14, you know, um, and, and that's a, a spectrum of disease, but for some of the higher risk patients um, with the number needed to harm of 83. So again, well accepted to um, distribute primary prophylaxis in this high risk population. And then finally, just seeing numbers from um, our orthopedic surgery outcomes for symptomatic VTE, number needed to treat a 50 um, versus major bleeding, number needed to harm 500. Um, and so how, we know these are high risk populations in the slide that I just showed you. And so how do we know which patients with cancer are high risk? Because in the very first slide for, that I showed you for epidemiology, we saw a big kind of wide distribution uh, for six month cumulative incidence all the way from prostate cancer at um, 3.8 fold increase up to Hodgkin's lymphoma, you know, 98 fold increase. So we know within cancer, not everybody is at high risk of venous thromboembolism. So there have been a plethora of risk scores developed to identify who is at highest risk of developing venous thromboembolism. The most validated um, and kind of accepted score is the Corona score. It does have limitations, but overall it's kind of the score um, where it has the most evidence at this time. And it takes into consideration a couple of features of the patient that increases their risk. So side of cancer, um, we know pancreatic cancer, gastric cancers, have a higher risk of venous thromboembolism than say breast or prostate. Um, so those patients get two points. Additional high risk cancers include lung cancer, um, lymphoma, the gynecologic malignancies, bladder and testicular in this study. Um, we know that elevated platelet count is a risk factor for thrombosis. Anemia is actually a risk factor for thrombosis. Um, leukocytosis is a risk factor and elevated BMI over 35. And some studies really showing even over 30. Um, so this, this score, patients with a score of two or more are now considered kind of at intermediate high risk. Um, and we'll talk about what we should do in those patients. These are all really derivatives of the Corona score. So they all took feature of the Corona score, they added or subtracted um, to try to improve the discrimination of the score. Um, but I, I think there, there really have not been large gains there are also um, disease-specific prediction models. Um, so the Corona score, for example, did not include patients with multiple myeloma, and the score does not perform well in that population. So our group, um, and then our group in collaboration with Ang Lee, developed impede VTE and SAVE score, which are preferred for multiple myeloma. There's been groups that have developed lung-specific scores, lymphoma-specific scores. So kind of take your choice, as long as it's validated, you do have options for risk prediction. So let's go back to our patients with a Corona score of at least two. Um, so we know that those patients are at high risk of venous thromboembolism um, based on, on studies within the first six months of initiation of cancer therapy. So there were two um, larger randomized control studies, the AVERT study and the Cassini study, which took these high risk ambulatory, so outpatient um, cancer patients who were initiating chemotherapy and had a Corona score of at least two points. So if you have pancreatic cancer, you, you already meet the criteria. You don't need anything else as an example. Um, and they randomized patients to either placebo. So it was a double, a placebo controlled double blind study. So they either received placebo for six months or low dose of Pixaban um, for the AVERT study or low dose Rivaroxaban for the Cassini study. You can see the distribution of patients. And so these, these um, randomized controlled trials, of course, are going to enroll patients predominantly who, um, so GI, thoracic, pancreas, lymphoma, gynecologic, those are all going to get a point on the Corona score. So you're going to see more of those patients within these studies um, accordingly. And instead of presenting the data individually, um, I'll just, there um, was a nice uh, meta-analysis published in Blood Advances in 2020 that, that looked at overall outcomes. There had been some historical studies with low molecular weight heparin as well, which they included in the study, but we'll, we'll really um, fo focus more on the direct role anticoagulation. So this top part here has the Cassini and AVERT study and looks at direct oral anticoagulation versus placebo. And we can see that over the six month treatment period, direct oral anticoagulation reduces the risk of first venous thromboembolism by 40% compared to placebo. Um, if looking at the difference in outcomes between the DOACs and low molecular weight heparin, there was no significant difference. 
Um, so overall, about a 50% reduction in the risk of first venous thromboembolism by giving anticoagulation for six months. So what does that translate to? That translates to a number needed to treat of 25 high-risk patients with um, cancer for six months to pre prevent one thrombotic event. If we look at the harm of our intervention, um, so you know, the looking at direct oral anticoagulants, um, there is a trend towards a higher risk of major bleeding with anticoagulation versus placebo, um, but it's not significant, um, and maybe you know, maybe arguably a little bit better with low molecular weight heparin. But again, between the two, there's no significant difference between the direct oral anticoagulants and low molecular weight heparin and overall no increase in the risk of major bleeding with thromboprophylaxis. And so this translates to a number needed to harm of 1,000 patients. Um, and so if we put that into context to so the first slide that I showed you, um, you know, the, the numbers really look much better for cancer in terms of preventing um, in this bottom arm. But I, I think this is really overall um, a poorly adopted strategy and most patients um, with cancer don't receive thromboprophylaxis for their first six months of treatment. I won't kind of read every line on this slide, but this is, this is basically just showing that our kind of our two main guidelines, the American Society of Hematology and the American Society of Clinical Oncology, both favor thromboprophylaxis uh, for patients starting therapy with a Corona score of at least two, um, and then um, individually for multiple myeloma. So I will end there to leave time for questions. Um, this is our group. This is your points code. Um, and thank you everybody for um, your attention. Kristen, that was a terrific talk. Thank you so much. I think we have time for a couple of questions. Mark. Yeah, no, that was fabulous. Um, uh, one thing I noticed with all these predictive models, I don't see them in one. Yeah, so with our impede VTE score, there's a group in South Carolina who we actually gave the data we used, which was VA data to develop those. And their goal is to try to beat our score through machine learning. So I think we're waiting to see their results. If they can beat us, then especially for like our efforts with the bleeding risk, we'll see if, if machine learning kind of wins versus a clinical intuition. But it's been, it's been a slow pickup um, overall in the cancer realm for anybody using the machine learning. I think we can't convince people to do thrombus prophylaxis when we can explain why the risk is there. And so that's the fear. Kristen, what's the opportunity for building in um, automatic alerts in either EPIC or in the VA system to remind people to start anticoagulation because of their high risk status versus relying on people's memory given a low uptake? Yeah, so I think, I mean, I think that, you know, the, the variables for like the Corona score, for example, some of the more complex scores that they, they wouldn't be able to do with the Corona score could easily pop up. You know, we wouldn't want it to continue to pop up after the patient's been cared for for so long because I think we'd get alert fatigue, but it could at least, I think, you know, having done the oncology side, especially at the VA and having to go over all the side effects of therapy with patients and prognosis, by the time you get through all that, you're, you're exhausted, the patient's exhausted. And so adding another thing you typically forget um, or put off. But I think if that popped up a couple times, they started a dose of therapy, now they're coming back, let's maybe address this. I think it could be helpful. Kristen, thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, thanks.